So what we are doing or what we have been doing is what we call as the representation theory. I would like to summarize everything what we did in last two classes or last few classes so that we can move forward. Now. So we just took an example, example of a parity operator and the identity operator together forming a group. And I said that let's just try to find out representations. So first we started by saying that let's choose a basis, basis which is nothing but a set of functions. In this case, where both are the eigenfunctions of the operator E and P, whatever the basis we are forming. Yeah, so we can, uh, first, in first case we said that phi1 is even, and then the representation was such that the both elements E and P got mapped to only one element, okay, one, so this, yeah. If we consider only odd function, then we find out that the both elements are mapped onto E to one and P to minus one, and both A1 and A2 are nothing but consisting of purely simple numbers, which is what we call as the one cross one representation. Now, one cross one I have written here as the irreducible representation because I know that I cannot reduce one cross one to lesser number. This is what we found later on, that these representations A1 and A2 turned out to be what we call as the irreducible representations and in some books, and in fact, all the books, in order to just reduce the text, it is written as irreps. Okay. Then we try to make higher order representation or higher dimensional representation. So we choose two functions, for example, in this case, phi x and phi minus x, such that the representation of E operator turns out to be a two cross two matrix, and of the P also turns out to be two cross two matrix. But P operator is not represented by a diagonal matrix. Yeah, so we find the third representation A3, which was the higher dimensional representation. And at this point, I said that please look that there exist many representations for the same group element. In fact, by this time, you know that you can write infinite many representations. You have you can just build higher dimension representations. But after that, I did something interesting. What did I do? In some sense, I came up with a concept called similarity transformation, which is nothing but going from a basis phi x phi minus x to the basis phi ax phi bx, that is the even in the odd function. And in this basis, that A4 representation came, where E is represented, of course, by identity matrix same, and P is represented, this P operator, parity operator is also represented now by a diagonal matrix 1, 0, 0, minus 1. So what I have written on the bottom is that there exists A3 representation, which under the similarity transformation gives A4 representation, which turns out to be diagonal one. And then I wrote something that A4 representation can be written as A1, plus A2 representation. So what I mean to say was that the first element, which is written as 1, 1, they are coming from my A1 representations. And the second element, which is there here, they come, came from A2 representation. And this is what we wrote as that A4, which is an equivalent representation of A3, can be written as the direct sum of irreducible representation. What it turns this gives a very important power that even though there exist many, many representations, but higher order or the higher dimensional representations can be reduced to some irreducible representations. Now, this in this case, we of course came up with the simultaneous diagonalization of all matrices of A3. You will see that the matrix which we got, which we call as P, unfortunately I use the same letter P, but because I used this P letter earlier also, but I hope we understand that P inverse P here, in the case of similarity transformation, is nothing but coming out of the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of our A3. And from there, we just basically figure out that if some matrix and simultaneously diagonalize all the matrices, then we can have a 
representation which can be reduced further. Now, in order to tell you that how these irreducible representations are used further, I told you that A reps are the building blocks. They can be used to construct higher dimensional reducible representations. And I just told you that, for example, I can build a five representation in which all the wave functions are even, and I have something which is the direct sum as nothing but three times A1. I have A6 representation in which I chose one even and two odd, and there I get A1 plus two, A2, so on and so forth. So you can continue to build higher order representations. Remember, every representation which you are building is going to meet the properties of the group which means that whichever representation you take, your original Kelly's theorem will, or sorry, Kelly's multiplication table will hold true. That E into E is E into P is P, P into E is P and P into P is E. So you'll find that that will hold true in all the presentation because that is how the rep representations are formed. Then I also told you in between that there exists something what we call as the faithful representation, which is nothing but the isomorphic representations with respect to the original group. So distinct matrices represent distinct elements of the group. And I also said that the order of representation is same as the dimension of the representation. So sometimes I say the two cross two matrices, for example, the dimension, that is what I call the order of the representation as well. Yeah. So at this point, I will again take a break. I mean, not exactly the break, but I will let you ask questions here because this is a very powerful and important concept with several terms coming in. Irreducible representation, equivalent representation, reducible representation, direct sum of representations, then simultaneous diagonalization. Of course, that is coming from the similarity transformation and is still the faithful representations, the dimensions, so on and so forth. So those two, these two pages contain the whole summary. Please ask questions. Either I was ex explicitly clear on what I explained or OK, you will read these things later on. Let's just continue with this one. OK, now. Abelian groups. What are abelian groups? Commutative groups. They are commutative groups, which means the element of the group G1, G2 is written as same as G2, G1, right? This is what the commutative property is. Now, this property, if you can think of, this is just the properties of the numbers. One cross one representation of the matrices. So five cross four is equal to four cross five. So abelian groups hold a very interesting properties the property that all abelian groups all abelian groups are reducible to one cross one irreps this is something which is making abelian groups rather interesting that if one has to think about what kind of fundamental building blocks are there for abelian groups, which is nothing but the irreducible representation. Then in these groups, they will always be re reducible to one cross one representation representation or a reducible representation. And why is it? Because every element G1 times G2 is G2 times G1. So whatever you are going to make can ultimately be reduced to numbers. But for non abelian groups. This may or may not be true. For non abelian groups, one has to figure out whether they can be represented by one cross one irreducible representation or not. So this is something which makes the group or the representation theory slightly different from abelian groups for the, from the non abelian groups because in the non abelian groups one has to keep on figuring out what will be the irreducible representation so in some cases you will find out that two cross two matrices they will be reduced to and then it cannot be reduced further so you may have irreducible representation of the matrices of the kind two cross two but not further whereas abelian groups they will always be so can somebody remind me any non-abelian group which I have done in the class? Any group 
of order one is it a non abelian group order one identity element no sir no sir order two e and p kind of group one okay e and a kind of group can that be non abelian no, no sir it has no, a cyclic sir. structure it cannot be what about three elements no sir no what about four elements there were two possible structures one was the cyclic structure surely has to be abelian and another was this z2 cross z2 structure remember the a square equal to e b square equal to a e a b square is equal to e which we wrote as a b is equal to c is equal to b a that was also a abelian so what about five group of order five a billion sir why uh, sir group of uh, prime numbers is uh, a billion why so only one type of structure is possible sir which is good 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 you are answering all which the questions correctly which correct. is uh, like cyclic which is like cyclic which is cyclic there cannot be any further substructure remember the lagrange theorem it cannot have any subgroup prime it's a prime number it it is divisible either by 5 or by 1 so these are the only trivial subgroups which are possible no other possibility anyway so that cannot be so what is the first non abelian group that means we did it in the class order 4 order 4 was not z4 and z2 into z2 both were abelian yes so it is the first one is d3 go back look into your kelly's multiplication table you won't find that all the elements will have this g1 dot g2 is equal to g2 dot g so this is the first one and hence this d3 group this is the reason why i generally choose uh, d3 group in between the groups because it is the first non abelian group having how many elements six elements six, six elements. elements so so please go back to arfken book and look at the example number 17.2.2 okay explicit example this is nothing but a group you will find out a non abelian group and it tries to simultaneously diagonalize the matrices and what it comes up with this is very interesting that in this case we can diagonalize it to the form to the form where we have one entry here then 0 0 then 0 0 and then it will be four entries so when here wherever i am drawing the square boxes these entries are non zero so we'll find out that this guy and this guy they form what is called the diagonal blocks so this one the first one is nothing but 1 cross 1 and the second one is nothing but a 2 cross 2 so d3 kind of representation for example which is a non abelian group can be written as the direct sum of let's say something what we call as a plus b where a is 1 cross 1 and b is 2 cross 2 matrices so d3 is reducible in that case you will find out but the reducibility to the irreducible blocks is such that it will be a diagonal blocks and hence they are called block diagonal matrices block diagonal matrices play very important role in quantum mechanics again not going there right now but we are actually getting diagonalization however the diagonalization will not return only the diagonal elements but the diagonal blocks in which cases where there are non abelian groups so abelian groups can always be reduced to 1 cross 1 irreps whereas non abelian groups they can be reduced to diagonal blocks or the block diagonal form but it is possible that one of the diagonal block is not a small dimension 1 cross 1 but of the dimension 2 cross 2 so this these are called block diagonal representation and how do we get it we get it for example let's say we get a matrix d3 
we will try to figure out some similarity transformation or unitary transformation here. Similarity transformation such that this guy can be written as the direct sum of matrices. It can be more than this also. I mean, this depends. But that's the idea that when we are talking about the irreducible representations, it is not that all the time you will get one cross one, but it is that you will get block diagonal form of the matrices. Questions here. Sir, can you please repeat this block diagonal concept in brief once again? Yeah, I mean, I would request you to go to the example 17.2.2 today. Uh, we have three classes and you will just come back to me, I would say. Yeah, that is why I am writing actually explicitly uh, this. In fact, if you are uh, having this, I can even tell you page number 823 is the place if you want to just jump onto that. Yeah, I, mean, I just want you guys to have a look at this first and then I will repeat this concept. It will be clearer after that. The example of equilateral triangles, sir. that one. Yes, yes. I mean, this is and the sir, D3 group, right? Remember, uh, equilateral yes, triangle is our D3 group. Yeah. Yes. So the other doubt is uh, we have four elements. We talked about the not non abelian group, sir. We yes. uh, um, did did an example that uh, four four elements group is also not a cyclic group and cyclic. We it's know not that a it is cyclic not a group. Yeah, sure. So, so why we uh, didn't take that example? To oh, no, I mean, uh, please, uh, please understand. Cyclic implies abelian. Sure, there is no doubt on this. But it is not that abelian group has to be cyclic all the time. Abelian group can be non-cyclic. So Z4, which is equal to Z2 cross Z2s. Somebody did say that, sir, we call this uh, group by some name and I called VA group. But I remember that we also call it by Klein group. I mean, this is a famous Klein. Yes, uh, I was group. the one who so, said it. Oh, so you did say that. So I forgot this Klein because I was using this VA group so common. But anyway. Uh, the point is that this Z2 cross Z2 structure is, is still uh, abelian structure. You just go back, look at the Kelly's multiplication table of this guy. It is not cyclic, but it is still abelian. Cyclic and abelian are two different things. In general, cyclic is generated by single one. Abelian is G1, G2, G2, G1. So this guy implies it, but the reverse is not always true that abelian has to be cyclic. No, that's not required. Abelian groups can be there. It is just that all the properties will have to, all the elements will have to hold this kind of property. You got the point. So this yes, Z4, Z2 into Z2 is still abelian. Uh, go back and look at the uh, Kelly's table. So every, is ele every element satisfying this property G1, G2 is equal to G2, G2. Just look into that. Okay, good. And then if all matrices involved are unitary. I mean, this is a rather simple concept. Then we call unitary representation. So what do I mean to say? So we have been writing matrices, right? So A3 representation, A4 representation, they were all matrices. If all the matrices involved in a group or in a representation, they are unitary. What is a unitary matrix? U dagger U is equal to I, which is I. equal to U U dagger or U dagger is equal to U inverse. So if all the matrices involved are unitary, then it is. What it is simple, it's called unitary representation. And do we know how to diagonalize unitary matrices? What kind of matrices we get? Unitary matrices. So it is done by something like this. So P inverse, remember diagonalization. So if there exists matrix like U, P, so that I get something like U prime, then what is the property which this P is going, going to have? This P inverse is equal to? Unitary matrices, diagonalization. I we did it for Hermitian matrices, for unitary matrices. Then this guy will have to hold this guy also. So that means that unitary matrices are 
always diagonalized by unitary matrices. Remember something which we did back in linear vector spaces, diagonalization of the Hermitian matrices and the uh, uh, unitary matrices. You will always get a unitary matrix as one of the diagonalizing matrix P. So you will find out that many times in the books, this kind of a structure is written for the unitary transformation or the similarity transformation instead of this. But that is just to say that unitary matrices can be diagonalized by unitary matrices. It's rather simple. It's easier to work with unitary matrices because then all you have to think about coming up with another unitary matrix to diagonalize. And how did we form unitary matrix by the way? How do we form it? You first find the eigenvalues. Then you find out the eigenvectors and then do you do what? So we normalize the eigenvectors. Normalize the eigenvectors to unity. Once you normalize the eigenvectors to unity, the normalized eigenvectors will form unitary matrix. That's what we did for the Hermitian and unitary matrices. So, OK, I mean, this is just extending the concept to the point that if unitary matrices are involved, then the diagonalization can be done by matrix which is holding this property p inverse equal to p diagonal uh, so similarity transformation in those cases are also called unitary transformation okay nothing beyond that and the concept which is coming directly from our uh, linear vector spaces so that means what you even if it is a non-diagonal block form can be diagonalized using some v which holds the property V dagger equal to V inverse such that you can write it down as. There also exists a possibility that if it is a very higher dimension, then you will have to diagonalize it further U double dagger so that this guy was reducible. This guy was reducible and finally I am writing a rips. So U1 plus U2. So you may need to diagonalize many times to reach to this irreps. But ultimately the point is that your irreps are the building blocks and you just keep on figuring out uh, your irreps in any uh, particular problem and you will be able to make higher dimension representation as well. So dimension theory, representation theory, even though there exists many representation, people continue to look for irreps for abelian. It is one cross one matrix uh, matrices, which is nothing but the numbers. And for non abelian, one has to see the diagonal blocks. And you are going to go through this example 17.2.2 and you will come back to me. By the way, I'm going to have one more example coming up, but not right now. I'll do it at the point where you will again revisit the same concept. Questions. So uh, concept. U2, U oh, I mean this guy, this is just uh, what we did D3, uh, sorry D represented by D prime is represent, uh, represented by what A1 plus A2, right? This is what we did in our problem. Yes, sir. Yes, if sir. the matrices involved are unitary, then we will call D as U, right? So here the representation of P inverse A times P, right? This is what we did or P inverse D times P. Now in this case, P inverse is basically unitary transformation. So if all the unitary matrices are involved, then it is easy to work with the representation because then even the diagonalizing matrix is also unitary. So we have just the unitary matrices taking care of everything, representation. And what is something which I am writing now, that every finite group can be represented by unitary representations means that whenever the groups are finite it is always possible to find out unitary matrices for representing it it's just that uh, what i did earlier is the same thing which i have written here except that the matrices involved are unitary and hence this p inverse will also obey this property that p inverse is same as p dagger remember finding out inverse is a little bit more difficult than finding out daggers and then unitary matrices, of course, are useful in so many ways. So uh, okay. I, mean, I hope that the point only is involved here is 
that instead of talking about any general two by two matrices or three by three matrices, if we somehow have unitary matrices. So given a matrix, can you tell me how to figure out the unitary matrices? I mean, A, B, C, D. If I have given you these elements, how will you figure out that this is a unitary matrix? What will you do? If the inverse is equal to the adjoint. That is true. What about the rows and the columns also? And the determinants? They, they will be orthogonal. They are orthogonal. Oh, yes. Right. The rows and the columns form normalized vectors. Each of it is normalized to unity. And then it is orthogonal to each other. And orthogonal vectors, remember, they are always useful in forming bases. Yeah, I mean, we did it long back in our linear vector spaces. And hence, unity matrices represent something which is quite useful. And the determinant of unity matrix? One. OK, so I should write this as one. So you should be EI theta determinant of you. So mod of determinant of the unitary matrix will be equal to one. That does not mean that the determinant will it, itself be one. It is just a phase factor EI theta. Your theta is any real number. OK, so I mean, I just wanted to say that generally you will find out the books write the unitary representations and not the diagonal uh, or not the non unitary matrices. There is a subtle difference between the two. That using non unitary matrices and using unitary matrices. And I am not going into that because of the paucity of time. Those guys who are interested really in this part of the group theory, they after the examination will revert back to me on my team chat and then I will tell you what is the difference between the two. Why we would like to represent everything by unitary matrices. So there is a subtle difference. I am not going into that detail just to save you from the examination point of view at this point of time. But later on, I am pretty sure those of you who are interested will come back to me. Fine. 